thank all of you for coming here to hear Jim and I. And it's a, it's a real privilege to be on this stage with, with Jim. I, all of the people in my business admire the work that Jim is doing enormously. Uh, he's not totally accurate all the time. <laughs> he said his talk would take 22 minutes. It took 19. Uh, also, he cheated a little bit. Did you notice his sleight of hand? It was that, as he said, there was a, the, the, the uh, uh, stockyard there in Colorado, he said. <laughs> and then he, then he and, I, and I thought he had missed the punchline because he went on. <laughs> they came back to it again and said, no, that was really a bunch of cow shit up there. <laughs> However, he did Northern California. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was not Northern California. It was Chino. It was Chino. <laughs> No, it, but uh, the, the real story on that picture, Jim, is that was a telephoto lens. It actually did four short. It was not quite that tall. Because I, I, I got another. I got <laughs> anyway, some of the questions which were just uh, asked at the end are sort of the, the, the substance of my talk. You know, I've been playing around with this stuff for a while. Um, my wife says too long. And, and you wonder, you know, questions were asked. You know, what, what does science got to do with this stuff? You know, how can we make it? Make any, any have it matter in the policy realm, and uh, in recent years, looking closely at uh, the issue and try to unravel how things have happened, um, it's been very instructive to me, and and and, uh, and it shows that clearly to me anyway that we have a lot of work to do and we got to work a lot of hard, a lot harder, and I think that as scientists we have to maybe think of our role as a little broader than just getting the numbers. We got to. You have to move out from, from that position in part. So my t title of, is there, and it's changed a little bit. Jim accuses me, and rightly so, of showing us some material there and then talking about some other stuff. <laughs> and he never, he never does that. He's very good. But I'm going to excuse me if I uh, do this. I'm going to talk about two cases, two cases uh, that are well known to all of you, uh, to see how things do play out in the screen of life. Uh, one is climate change, a big issue, um, and that's probably the best case. And then there's uh, you know, loss of biodiversity, and that's another big issue. And that's probably the worst case of how policy science has, has, has played out. And why is that so, and how is it going? Well, let's look at the, uh, you know, climate change is a big issue. Big, big issue, and we see it in the press all the time. You know, it was 30 years ago that the scientific community finally said, got up and said at the World Meteorological Organization meeting, we have a problem here. 30 years ago they said that. And that, that was the tail end of a long uh, period of individuals getting up 100 years ago and saying that you know, the increased uh, CO2 is going to cause a, a climate change problem. So 30 years ago. So what happened? Um, the, the IPCC, which you've heard about, which won the Nobel Prize, um, was established in 1988. Um, that was the WMO, again, pushing this and, and joined together with UNEP, so they were the two leaders. And the important thing here is that little yellow name, Mr. Bert Boleyn, a genius in the sense that he was an absolute top-rate scientist, but he also held government positions. He understood about policy, so he had knowledge of both uh, science and policy. And he was the one for, who pushed uh, for the uh, formation of the IPCC, and he was appointed the first chairman. And what was so critical about that is he knew these processes, processes so well that he designed the convention which followed in a way that the IPCC, was in, the science, was independent from um, the, those who funded it, the governments, intergovernments. The only, only thing that the governments could do, they worked out this arrangement, was could work on the wording of the executive summary. They could not tinker with the science that went into the, the uh, IPCC documents, these huge documents. But that was a, 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 I don't know how he ever pulled this off, but he did, and it, to our great benefit. Okay, then the UN uh, General Assembly requested um, the uh, IPCC report. It was done in time for the Rio Convention in um, 1990, the big environmental convention. The science was done before the convention was crafted, the, the climate convention. That's crucial. The science, there's a science foundation for what was going to go on in these things. 
and there were th there were three activities at, at in 1990 in Rio, 1992. The four people could not get their act together, so they did not come up with a convention. They came up with principles. That's because it was such a hot but button issue on deforestation in, in tropical countries that these the tropical countries did not want a convention. Um, there was the, uh, the climate convention, and then there was the one I'm going to be talking about next, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which had a very different history and is part of the problem we have today. Okay, uh, well, the climate convention, um, they had some, the next important thing was some very specific targets written in the convention, both to stabilize greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and they define what climate change was it had to be attributed directly to the action of humans. Uh, and this was a hard task because, just, as you know, interannual variation in climate, but it had to be shown there was human impact. And how to do that, and, and the bar was set so high that you had to show this is, this is uh, humans are doing it, and, and in order to, to, the level it was set was 90% confidence. And was a lot. This was in the early days, and uh, there's a lot of noise, and and so there's been these repeated uh, assessments. Another reason for having them. 1995 was the second one. 2001, uh, the third, and 2007, just recently. Finally, they've gotten to the. They've reached the bar. 90 percent uh, certainty that uh, humans are causing climate change. Now, what would if you were to buy insurance? Uh, how, how much would you pay for insurance when it was 90 percent probability you're going to die tomorrow? It's going to be pretty high insurance. Well, it's the same with climate change. You know, now that they push us up there, 90 percent uh, certainty that we're we're causing it, and now we have to deal with it. So now, some 30 years later, we're at the tipping point. We're not there yet. We're at the tipping point, and I think Bert Bolin uh, owes we owe a lot, a lot of. Um, thanks to him for setting the process in the right direction, in the right way, with targets, with uh, science independence, and uh, all, all these things that he, he did. Burke Boleyn just died this year. Uh, he died um, before he could go to, uh, to Norway to uh, be the recipient of the Nobel Prize. Now, let's look at the other convention, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, a very different story. Um, now, just going back, the tipping point, we're at a tip we haven't done anything yet. We haven't done anything yet on climate change, but boy, we should, what, what more do we need? So we, that we're there where something's got to happen, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, conserve biological diversity, equitable sharing of resources, and so forth. Now, this is the problem in that convention. It, it, it uh, has two parts, as you see, and, and the yellow one is the one that's been the the main driver, and the white one people have ignored. Uh, the convention, it's an international convention, but it's built on national rights. And it's not like the atmosphere is you know, all around us. This is national rights and the, the sovereign rights to exploit the biodiversity in their own, in their own country. And they're supposed to, in the white, worry about uh, resources from their country going somewhere else, biological resources, and causing damage. Well, that's biological invasions. So your country just delivered a weed to us, it's destroying our crops, you owe us some money. No one talks like that, but they should because that's in the convention, but it's not, it's ignored. The, the targets, here's just one, uh, Article 8, it, it's throughout the whole convention. Each contracting party, that's the, that's the nations, shall as far as possible and as appropriate, that's how binding that is, do the best you can, gang, do the best you can to do this big thing. So uh, the convention itself is very weak. Um, didn't have any binding targets. It wasn't based on science. There wasn't a science assessment done before the convention was set up. It was not based on science. Well, so scientists decided, well, maybe, maybe we could help this convention if we did a retrofit and did a science assessment now that the convention's already going. And uh, this is a, a question that I asked. I did. I asked that question to the chief negotiator uh, for the convention from Canada, who played a very important role in that, that convention. I said, just as we were just thinking about doing a, a science assessment for biodiversity and proposing it to the uh, uh, convention people, 
wouldn't it be nice to have the science assessment? He said, no. He says, because the, the biodiversity convention is about values. And, and in, right, in, in part, that's right. It is about fundamental vi- uh, values of, of the ethics of, of preserving uh, living organisms. But still, science has a lot to play, and I'll, hopefully I can explain what that is. It, was, it, got, even, it got worse from there on, actually. That was the beginning of bad, and then the bad got worse. Uh, this was a meeting of the Scientific uh, Advisory Committee for the Convention on Biological Diversity, where um, Bob Watson um, first presented what was, was intended. The UNEP was going to do this uh, uh, new assessment. And um, the, a representative from Brazil got up after uh, Bob Watson, uh, I think I was pretty sure it was Bob, and Jose Saracan was, uh, was chairing this. And the representative from Brazil got up and said, we didn't ask for it, we don't want it, and if you produce it, we won't use a damn thing. And why he said that, why they said because this is a national issue. And now you're talking, an international assessment, you're bringing all these issues of of uh, you know loss of the forest and what that means to you know, the atmosphere and all these kinds of global problems, but they didn't want to talk about the global problem because that's the way the convention was crafted. Well, we did it anyway. Uh, did this nice uh, fifth, eleventh, one thousand one hundred and forty pages. It's an incredible uh, doorstop, and I recommend you buy it. <laughs> There's actually a lot of good stuff in it, but it's it's sort of it's sort of naive stuff in a way. It's scientists telling all about biodiversity and how important it was. It didn't, it didn't sort of get to the issues of how, uh, how we, we need to preserve it and so forth and, and what the options were. Well, then, scientists being uh, persistent said, well, that didn't work. We'll try again here. We're going to do it a different way. And uh, this time, we're going to do it right. What was wrong about the first time is that we didn't ask governments, do you want this assessment? We just did it and say, here it is. And they didn't like that. And that's why they, they reacted so strongly against it, and also they didn't like the international aspect. So we have a different approach, uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which was just complete, was completed a few years ago. And it was quite different, very different in its, in its structure. Rather than selling the values, which are crucial, you know, about uh, preserving biodiversity and, and not losing these resources, a different framework was used. It was looking at, at the biodiversity, but the biodiversity in relationship to the services that they provide to society. That's a simple little wording, but it had an enormously different impact on policymakers. Well, we, uh, uh, we're elected by society. You're talking about things that serve society. We're not talking about esoteric conservation things, but real services. And so that changed the whole dynamic. And, this, uh, and furthermore, it looked at the biodiversity in the lower left-hand corner, uh, services in relationship to the human well-being of, of people, and there are all the dimensions. And then we not only looked at the at the direct drivers, which we normally look at, looking at impacts, you know, climate change and so forth, but the indirect drivers, population and, and cultural and religious uh, beliefs and so forth. So I think that this was called the conceptual framework, and it was, I think, resonated quite well uh, with the policy community, with the science community, and so forth. It brought natural and sci- uh, social scientists together. It viewed, as I say, services in terms of uh, biodiversity, in terms of uh, benefits to society. It documented, and the most important part of the, the uh, assessment was looking through time and how these services are being are are being changed. And it not only it, another reason it was so attractive to a lot of policymakers was it. It, uh, it looked at it globally as well as sub-regionally in various parts of the world, the high mountains of, of Peru, villages and villages in, in, in uh, India and so forth. So it was real places, real people facing these real problems. It brought, we're talking about services, services, goods, that's uh, economics, you know. Uh, it brought um, the business community together with uh, the environmental community in a big way. Um, it brought there's always been this big fight between environmentalists and the develop- people who worry about development in, parts, in, in the poor parts of the world. Well, we showed how these can, uh, you could, protecting the environment is protecting uh, well-being of people, in, particularly in, in where societies which are dependent directly on natural resources. 
Well, the actual assessment uh, showed one important thing. The last 50 years, when I, in my generation, was having fun, we were really doing a lot of big-term mining in terms of the resources. That's when, that's when it all happened. So in the last 50 years, uh, big changes in, in uh, water depletion, land degradation, and so forth. And so we did analyses, uh, four volumes here, showing the degradation of a number of these resources. 60% of the ecosystem services provided by, by nature are being degraded. And some are being enhanced, like we're doing great on livestock, <laughs> crops, and so forth, sequestration of carbon, and some are mixed results. But that was it. So as sort of a, an abbreviated conclusion here, uh, we gave a whole bunch of responses that uh, society could... Uh, um, change those trajectories. We did scenarios for the future, and uh, so some of those. I guess our trajectories show that doing just uh, business as usual was, wasn't going to work. Uh, even doing some pretty substantial things still wasn't going to get us uh, to where we needed to go. And so we need some fundamental changes in in institutions and in, in how we value uh, natural capital and how we pay for it and so forth. So there were a lot of a lot of things there. Um, but um, and, and the MA has had a pretty large impact in one direct, in one sense. Institutions, NGOs around the world are using this framework. Uh, governments, the, the Parliament uh, looked at it and recommended to all their agencies use it in, in the UK and so forth. But it hasn't ent really, still has not entered into the policy realm as yet. I think institutionally, it's had a big impact. Now, I just uh, unfortunately, I'm one of these people who have a short attention span, a short memory. And uh, I will tell you about what I saw yesterday. Actually, it was last week. I went to a meeting, and it's relevant to this because what I've been showing you is sort of a difficult case. But however, so, since a number of you are marine biologists here, I went to I went to a meeting in Monaco, and the problems that I've been talking about are amplified a great deal in the open ocean. It's you know we know you all seen these figures, the depletion of the, of the fisheries uh, in that period, um, the FAO figures as modified by Daniel Pauley, showing the reduction in the, the fishery catch and so forth. Um, the fishing deeper and deeper and deeper, going down the food chain, going down in depth, with just enormous mining of, this, of, of, the, of the open ocean in particular. And um, it's one of the most difficult problems, I think, that we face. I mean, it's the commons. This is, we're talking about the open ocean now, beyond the, the, beyond the limits. So it's a, it's, a, it's a common, it's the most difficult of all environmental problems. And there are all kinds of perverse incentives by nations to, uh, and ways of getting around any, uh, any agreements. There are a whole series of, of very narrow uh, conventions, you know, the whale and so forth, but there's no integrated whole convention or a million NGOs out there, it's just a mess. Um, there's 3.3% of the ocean is, is now uh, in a reserve. And we need 100 times that in order to, to maintain systems. And then what gets me, as a, as a terrestrial biologist, you look at a summary, you look at a thing like the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment even, there's the high forest, the low forest, the big jungle, the, you know, the, the wetland, all these different systems, and then there's the ocean. That's the texture given to that huge system which covers so much of the world. And then you go to a, if you go to a, I hope you don't have, do you have a fishery school here? Do you have a, <laughs> well, if you go to some of these uh, big marine programs, you see it's all fisheries. Everything is dominated by fishery um, perspective. It's like viewing the forest as bo in board feet, I mean, looking at you know, catch a fish. So that viewpoint is, is not, not helped, and that's coming from the marine side there. And finally, and this is true for so many of these things, I mean, Jim, talked about some really important issues, and boy, what fraction of the population even understands any of what he's saying. You know, it's very, very crucial, very important, but in the oceans too, I go out, you go out to dinner with very educated people who read a lot, and, uh, and they think that aquaculture is all really, you know, a plus, and there's some of the fish they don't think, they order swordfish and things like that. This, the, fun, the general public doesn't get these things, and how are you gonna move anywhere Without that, um, without that understanding. 
Well, uh, then, unfortunately, as, as you probably know, the next 50 years is going to be worse than the last 50 years, and that's because of global trade. Uh, where global trade has a, tr a tremendous amount of, of downsides, and in fact, I'm going to be using some of my prize money to, to, to look at the, all the, the um, uh, impacts of, of global trade on invasive species and continuing our work with Jim on, on, the, on trade of grain. And then there's the climate change we're going to see, and we're going to see ocean acidity increasing. So there's a big changes which are coming, and they're going to have impacts. There's no, no, no way about it. No, no question about it. So what does this mean? It means that we've got to do a lot better. And uh, I, I don't know. Uh, that, um, I think the science community is moving too slowly. You know how long it takes to do one of those assessments? You know, five years minimum. And then it goes through this other process. So the science is moving too slowly, and I think the policy is moving too slowly for the problems that we have. And somehow we've got to, we, we have to come up with a way to speed all this up. And part of that is, is better informing the public in a, in a way that they can understand, and, and that's a, a, a tricky business. But we're talking about the welfare of their offspring. The welfare of their offspring. You keep hammering that message in. We're not talking about you, we're talking about your kids and your grandkids. But we're not, uh, doing that very well. So here's my little cartoon here, what we need to do. I think scientists have to, uh, they do their job, as uh, Jim says, they have to do it very, they do it very well, but I think that they, they, uh, they confine their job a little too narrowly. I really do think that. You know, we have a program in Ecological Society of America called the Aldo Leopold Program, which we do is we, we find the, the, the brightest young people in science today, in environmental sciences, and, and then give them, they're just, they just got tenure, so they don't have to worry about things, and give them training to talk to the press, to talk to TV, to talk to Congress. And that's, now we have 100 young, the best young scientists we have trained in things in order to communicate with, uh, with the general public. Well, we, this triangle here, science, uh, policy and the public. I think there's interactions uh, between them, and, and I think this. I just gave a seminar the other day, some department, and the, the young people told me, well, their professors say that they, they should do base, basic science and not have anything to do with anything that has anything to do with policy at all. And I think that uh, that's. They, we have to do fundamental science. We have to do the best we can. But no matter how, how fundamental it is, I think there's a message that you can that we need to, to reach out with. And I also think we need um, this, this inform the public better inform, and because the public puts pressure on the, on, the, on the policy realm. But we need heroes too. And I was looking at the, uh, uh, before they went wrong in the, in the Tyler Prize, uh, <laughs> there are a bunch of really incredible people who I think we could put in, that, in those boxes for the heroes who look at that interface between science and the, and, and, the, uh, and the public, and science and policy, and, and the public and policy. And we, we need heroes. I mean, Gore, that, we get back to the tipping point. We're almost there, but, but uh, who's pushing it? You know, it's, it's got, we've got to get it to the public, and we need heroes like Gore and others to stand up and say, this is important. And then the resources he's brought, he's mustered resources from uh, independent sector, the private sector, to, to have put on these big uh, campaigns, that movie, was not a cheap movie that he made, uh, and, and there's now a, a second campaign to, to, to move forward. So we need more heroes to, to push that public uh, science policy interface. And um, I think their NGOs are certainly serving that role in, in many ways. And we need more Bert Bolines, people who understand the science and policy, to help us out. But things are going to come fast down the track, and uh, we have to to move faster, we have to th we have to stand up. What are we doing, and how fast uh, is it is it helping, or, or is there some other way? Well, you know, what let's think let's think broadly, let's think big, and, and to, to to go those directions we have to go. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for um, coming here today to hear Jim, and uh, incidentally to hear me. <laughs> Thank you.